Right, OK, thanks, Mr Hudson. Um, and good morning, good afternoon, whatever time it is. Yeah, so... Um, 1981, I was, um, I was actually a cop. Um, so I thought I'd better establish my credentials first to talk about the Springbok tour, just in case you think I'm just some guy Mr Hudson dragged in off the street. Um, so, yeah, so you can see um, in 1981, I was, um, that's me there. I had a lot more hair and I was just a slightly bigger, but not much bigger. Um, in 81, I'd been in the police for uh, six years. So I was a relatively, still a relatively new, um, new police constable. Um, and just to, just to let you know that I was who I am, I've got a wee memento from the Springbok tour here. Um, one, one of the guys on our squad, Red Squad, had these made, and we all got given one at the end of the year. So just to, that's just my, my credentials. And also, um, you can see in the photograph that we're wearing these coats, and these are called great coats. So this is my old great coat. It hasn't got any police insignia on it. But I'll pass it around, and you can just feel how heavy it is, and might have some bearing later on when I start talking about the tour itself. So, 1981, I think it's really important that, um, for a start, when you're dealing with protests and things, you look at the culture of the country at that time, and also um, the, the political scene at that time in 81. So, you right, mate? I'll just get up and bring it across. So, in 1981, New Zealand was still very much, in terms of the culture um, was still very much a rugby, a rugby culture. You know, rugby was our main game. Um, it was, you know, if you went to any school, you might have one or two football teams, maybe, but rugby was was the big sport. Um, and as part of that, um, the Springboks were the tra traditional foe. You know the South Africans and the New Zealanders, the All Blacks, they were the, thanks, mate. They were the top, top rugby teams in the, in the country. So I was brought up in that sort of that rugby sort of atmosphere. I played rugby, and that was you know, and the Springboks were, shall we say, the enemy. And to play against the Springboks or to watch them play, was you know that was sort of the pinnacle, of of your rugby sort of life. That makes sense so far? Yeah? So that, that was the sort of culture. And rugby was particularly strong in, in the um, rural areas, you know, the, the provinces, um, Invercargill, you know, Southland, South Canterbury, um, Northland, those sort of places, really, really strong, really strong. And to have the Springboks come to our country, that was a... A fantastic, a fantastic chance to see these guys play rugby and to, and to, and to talk with them or to, to see them. The other thing I think you need to understand is the political, political culture at the time, the political scene. In 81, our Prime Minister was a guy by the name of Rob Muldoon. A little short guy, had a scar on his, big scar on his cheek where he, that he got from the Second World War. Had a shocking laugh. <laughs> he was a terrible, but he was a real cunning little devil. He was pretty cunning, he was a very astute politician. And in 81, there was a general election coming up. And he knew that the, the rural provinces in New Zealand, they were marginal seats. If, he could win, if his party could win them, he knew that he would probably get back into, into power, into government. And he also knew, or he had an inkling, that if he cancelled the Springbok tour, those people in the marginal seats in the rural, rural provinces, you know, I'm talking Southland, South Canterbury, uh, West Coast, um, um, Whangara, uh, Northland, Waikato, they probably wouldn't vote for him because they were 
the backbone of New Zealand rugby, and they wanted to see the, see the Springboks. So that's the sort of background um, that we're dealing with when the government or the New Zealand Rugby Union invited the Springboks to New Zealand. The government initially said, we're hands off. We don't interfere with sport. They had this idea that sport and politics don't mix. Well, you know, as, as we know, they do. There's always politics and sport, OK? So you had Muldoon, who was backing, who was backing off, letting, letting the rugby union do their thing, because he, was, he wanted to get back into power, back into the government. OK, so that's, that's that. So, 1981, I was working in Auckland, and I was part of a, um, part of a unit called Team Policing. Now, team policing, our job in those days, we were tasked with taking care of um, disorder and all those sorts of things in Auckland City. In those days, uh, the pubs closed at um, 11 o'clock at night, and at 11 o'clock at night, or quarter past 11, the streets just become crowded with blinking drunks and all sorts of things, a lot of disorder. So our job as a team policing unit was to go and police the hotels and to police the streets and things after the pubs closed. And we had a group of about uh, 30 cops, or 33 really, had about five sergeants and about 25 constables, and we used to travel around as a team. Um, we were also tasked with policing the gangs. In those days, gangs were, were still, still very big and causing a lot of problems. So that was our job. We, were, we had to, to police the gangs. So we were used as a team. We, we were very familiar with dealing with large crowds and mobs of disorderly people. And that's the reason why, in 1981, when the Springbok tour got the go-ahead um, and the police were told to, well, this is your baby, you look after it, they formed... Uh, two, two different squads, uh, Red Squad and Blue Squad. Red Squad, which I was part of, were co was comprised of a team policing unit in Auckland, um, also some cops from South Auckland and some cops from Whangarei. And we all got together as one big team. About, uh, oh, and also West Auckland. So we had Auckland Central, West Auckland, South Auckland and Whangarei. So he had about 50, probably 50 odd, 56 odd cops. Um, and then for the South Island, they had a uh, squad called Blue Squad. And they were also um, a team policing unit um, from Christchurch and some guys from Wellington also. And they did, they, their task was to look after the South Island. Well, that didn't quite work out as things, as things eventuated. So prior to prior to eighty one, prior to the Springboks arriving, uh, we the whole our whole Red Squad personnel we got together and we had a, um, a four day training session at the um, Papakura Army Camp. Uh, just we just got these things called um, PR twenty fours long batons. I I've lost mine, so I couldn't bring it over for you. Um, and we had to learn how to learn how to use them. Um, and how to, how to work a little bit better as a team in terms of controlling um, mobs or, or crowds. Because we knew that this tour was going to cause a lot of problems, a lot of disorder. We didn't realise just how much it was going to cause. You know, that's okay. So we spent about, a, spent about uh, three or four days down at Papakura learning how to work as a team, um, how to form skirmish lines, how to use our battens properly, um, and all that sort of carry on. In 81, just a bit of a sidetrack here, um, I got married in March 81. Um, and in July, three months after I got married, I was off touring the country uh, with the Springboks for about uh, a month and a half. So my poor old wife, newly married, she's left at home by herself. I don't know how she felt about that, she didn't say anything, but um, it must be pretty hard for her especially watching TV and in the later stages of the tour and seeing, seeing the sort of um, protests that were going on. 
Now these, yeah, so the protests, they weren't peaceful protests. Initially they started out being pretty peaceful, but um, for one reason or another, they um, become quite violent. And we'll talk about that later on. Any questions so far? Anybody got any questions? Let's just have a bit of background. No? Yeah, mate. Do you get like physically hurt when you're like doing this? I'll come to that, yep. Good question, I'll come to that, eh? Yeah. Okay, so. Oh, sorry, um, I was just going to ask, were there any like top roles in the red squads? Like, did any. you have any director roles or any? Top roles. Um, yeah, there was, yeah. Um, so the Red Squad, we had um, the guy in charge was an inspector and then underneath him um, you had uh, three senior sergeants. Under the senior sergeants you had um, about eight or seven sergeants and then the troops like me. Yeah, so that, that hierarchy was there. Inspector, senior sergeants, um, sergeants and then constables. Yeah, okay. Um, Any other questions? No. One of the reasons, and Red, Red Squad, for some reason, during the tour, uh, we we got the uh, we got the um, the um, what we're we looking for. We were sort of portrayed as the thugs of the place, the strong men, the guys you call them when there's big trouble. I don't know why. Um, Possibly partly because our, one of our senior sergeants was very, very charismatic and very outspoken. Um, and when he was talking to the media, uh, he, he, uh, he called a spade a spade and, and let them know what was going on. Uh, but he was very outspoken. His name was Ross Morant. And he eventually became a member of parliament for National. And once again, he was a bit of a, a, bit of a devious sort of a guy, but yeah. Um, and he actually wrote this book here. Um, the Red Squad. So that's a book by Ross Morant. He was a senior sergeant um, on on the squad at the time of the tour. So eighty one came along, and um, our first our first game, or the first game, was in Gisborne. That was the first game, and yeah, it was the coldest I've ever been in my whole life. It was freezing. I'd only been to Gisborne, I hadn't been to Gisborne before then, but it was freezing. Within Red Squad, we had this other little squad called the Tackle Squad. And the Tackle Squad was just five of us, and our job was to, if any protesters or demonstrators got onto the, onto the field, we were supposed to go out and tackle them and bring, bring them down. Okay? Um, and we, we were actually, we were given track suits and a pair of rugby boots. And that, was, that was awesome. I got a brand new pair of rugby. I was on the tackle squad. Um, I got a brand new pair of rugby boots and a brand new tracksuit out of it. Um, but that squad only stayed together for about one game. After Gisborne, they realised that nah, this waste of manpower, having five guys poncing around in tracksuits. Um, if the demonstrators are going to get on the field, they get on on mass, and um, you haven't got a show of you know stopping them. I actually made one tackle. At Springbok training, there was a small group of demonstrators in Gisborne um, where the Springboks were training, and one of these guys climbed the fence and tried to run on and, and make a bit of nuisance of himself. Um, and I was a clown who, who managed to tackle him and bring him down. So that was my claim to fame. Yeah. Anyway, so, after, so Gisborne was pretty quiet. Um, we didn't see a lot of the demonstrators. Um, they, they, they were at the airport when the Springboks arrived. Um, they tried to get onto the, onto the tarmac, but other members of the Red Squad, there was three sections. Um, the first section, they stopped them from getting onto the tarmac um, and you know, sort of being a nuisance. And the Springboks took off and they, um, they stayed in the hotel. Um, we didn't see, hardly saw them. We were just sort of poncing around, um, sitting on their backside, just doing nothing. Uh, and the same during the game, during the, during the Gisborne game, uh, the, f the field was sort of sealed off, not to the degree that fields were sealed off later on, but we hardly saw a demonstrator, so it was pretty quiet. 
after Gisborne, after Gisborne, we flew to um, Hamilton. Yeah, that was a different story. Have you heard about Hamilton, the Hamilton, the Hamilton um, experience with the Springbok tour? Anybody know what happened there? I know it's ancient history, but... That wasn't the flower bomb thing, was it? No, that was Eden Park. Yeah, close. So at Hamilton, okay, the, spring, the, the, the demonstrators actually managed to get onto the field, um, which was a real, a real turning point for the tour. And in a lot of ways, the fact that the, the, the demonstrators managed to invade the rugby pitch worked against them. And I'll, and I'll try and explain why soon. So, at the time of, of an 81, or and even prior to that, with, with large gatherings and large dem demonstrations, the police had a policy of minimum deployment, maximum reserve, which basically meant that you'd see about sort of very few cops out the front of demonstrators. But if things got ugly, most of the cops were back sitting under, um, sitting somewhere, um, ready to go if things turned ugly. And if things turned ugly, we just poured out and, and made a nuisance of ourselves. So it was minimum reserve, minimum deployment, maximum reserve. Most of the guys were back behind the scenes. You couldn't see them. So in Hamilton, that happened in Hamilton. Um, the day of the game, they had a few cops surrounding the outside or surrounding the, the perimeter of the field. The, the field was all um, you know, um, fenced off and they had a few cops standing around guarding the perimeter. Um, the demonstrators knew this and um, they knew, OK, we're going we're gonna to invade the pitch. Now, stupid enough, the police knew that before the game, about a couple of days beforehand, that the demonstrators were going to try and invade the pitch. We knew that. You know, the bosses knew that. And our boss, our inspector, he tried to convince the guys above him, the, the commissioner and these sort of guys, look, you need to have, you need to change your policy. You need to have maximum deployment, stop these demonstrators from getting to the park and keep the minimum in reserve. But nah, you know, cops are pretty pig-headed at times and they wouldn't change their wouldn't change their, 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 their strategy. So Red Squad, 56 odd guys, specially trained to deal with demonstrators. We were sitting under the grandstands on our backsides doing nothing. Meanwhile, out on the perimeter of the field, by the fence line where the demonstrators were causing problems, you had these other poor cops who weren't trained, were just in their normal uniform, um, no long batons, no right helmets, nothing at all. And the demonstrators actually tore down part of the fence and invaded the pitch. About, probably about 200, 300 of them. And they just stood in a big group, middle of the pitch, and wouldn't move. At that stage, we got deployed, and we went out, 50 of us, 56 of us, and we formed a circle around the demonstrators. Um, and our task was to try and remove them from the pitch. Yeah, okay. Meanwhile, up in the blinking, up in the stands and on the embankments, you had probably 25,000 rugby supporters all waiting for us to, to move these demonstrators and for the game to start. Now, there's no way were we going to remove 250 demonstrators who didn't want to be removed um, in time for a game to start. So it was, a, it was no, no go from there. And also at the same time, uh, we had intelligence that, um, when I say we, I mean the police, we had intelligence that there was some clown who had um, taken a plane from Ardmore Airport, which was just north of Waikato, north of Hamilton, and was going to crash the plane into the grandstand. So we had all these things going on. We had the 250-odd 250, 250 demonstrators in the middle of the field who weren't going to move, all chanting, 
You had about 25,000 rugby supporters around the outside uh, yelling and shouting and telling us to get these demonstrators off the field so the game could go on. And we had this clown who had stolen the plane from an airport and had implied that he was going to crash it into the, into the grandstand at the park. So at that stage, it was after about probably uh, an hour or so of a bit of a stalemate, um, the game was called off. Oh, holy heck. All hell broke loose. Can you imagine you had 25,000 rugby fans who had paid good money to watch the game being told that this little bunch of people in the middle, 250 people, had caused the game to be cancelled. So our job then changed from removing the demonstrators from the field to protecting them as they left the field. Now, as they left the field, they were getting bombarded with bottles, cans, rocks, all sorts of things. And we had to try and, we had to try and look after them. But it didn't stop just as they left the field. Even as they were going through town, there were cases where they were chased through town by rugby fans with batons and things and we're going to smack them over. So the whole thing turned really ugly. And at that stage, as I said before, that's when the whole Springbok tour became an issue of law and order. Okay? Now, at that, at that time in, in history, the police's job was quite simple. To maintain law and order okay, and preserve the peace. So we were then tasked, the police department were then tasked with, OK, the Springbok tour is going to go ahead. You guys are tasked with maintaining law and order and, and preserving the peace. So that's, in some ways, how, the, how when the demonstrators invaded the pitch, how it worked against them. Because at that stage, the government said, we're going to give you money to do what you have to do. And the budget for the Springbok tour, I think, was initially about $5 million, but it blew out to about $15 million, which in those days was quite a lot of money. Um, so at that stage, the, um, the government, they, they said to the cops, you know, the commissioner and people, what do you want? What do you need? They called in the army. They called in the Air Force. And uh, the army... A few, if next games, they all set up barbed barb wire perimeters around the fields. They set up, you know, the big skip, rubber skips, had big rubber skips all set up so that you had to channel, the demonstrators couldn't just sort of walk down the street. The streets were blocked off. They blocked the streets off, um, you know, sort of 500, 600 metres from the actual field with these big skips and barbed wire and things. Um, yeah, and uh, things should have been a lot easier. Hmm, should have been. Question so far? Yeah, wait. So, like, now nah, there's, like, barbed wires and, like, like rubbish areas of like there. How are the people actually supposed to watch the game as they get into the stadium? That's, that's the big problem, eh? So, in protest, there are, there's always three groups. There are those protesting against whatever. There are those who are protesting against the protesters who, uh, who think that, you know, things should be as they are. And then right smack in the middle are the poor old cops. Basically the meat and the sandwich. So you had your anti-tour protesters, you had your people trying to get to the game, and you know, when I say it wasn't just a few, you know, you're talking thousands trying to get to the game, and then you had this bunch of guys in blue uniform trying to preserve the peace, trying to keep the two, the two groups apart so there was no, no um, sort of major fighting and stuff. So we had to, we had to um, sometimes clear a path for the guys and girls and ladies to get to the game. So that meant pushing the demonstrators out of the way and forming a line between them and the people going to the game. Not easy. And the best demonstration of that is at, um, at Wellington, the first test, second test at Wellington on the corner of um, Adelaide Road and Rintoul Street. Yeah, Rintoul Street. So you've got Adelaide Road there, 
Rintoul Street, and then you've got Athletic Park where the game was played up here somewhere. So the whole road, the whole road was blocked by protesters. And I'm talking, and they were just sitting there. You know, they wouldn't move. Meanwhile, you've got umpteen thousand rugby fans coming down Adelaide Road to get to Athletic Park. <clears throat> you can imagine, you know, you can imagine the bloody chaos that could have ensued. Um, yeah, so and then at Athletic Park, um, Athletic Park is sort of surrounded by hills. So, so as part of Red Squad, once we once we got once we had got the players, no, the the um, the fans into the game, the protesters then decided they were, they were going to march around athletic, the streets of Athletic Park, and basically we had to make sure that we we sort of followed them or ahead of them, so that they couldn't breach the perimeter, so to speak. And if you can imagine, we wore this thing all the time, and it's blinking heavy. Um, so you can imagine that we had to run. I mean, not just we had to sort of run all up and down these blinking hills at blinking Wellington, wearing that, that clobber, big boots, ride helmet, and a PR24. Um, it was blinking hard work and blinking hot. Um, and it wasn't easy. Um, Athletic Park, we started at about five in the morning and we didn't finish work until about, probably about seven that night. So that's a 14 hour day. Um, we were working for, and a big part of that, big part of that day was running around the streets of Wellington in this blinking clobber, um, trying to keep demonstrators away, and trying to keep rugby fans under control. Really, really hard, yeah. Um, so, Protesters, police, rugby fans. Palmerston North game, the game against Manawatu. Palmerston North game was the first game after Hamilton where um, we had all the support of the, the bins and stuff and all sort of carry on. And we were tasked with stopping the demonstrators getting anywhere near the park. So what we used to do is we used to form what's called a skirmish line. Um, you know, so I'm in the middle and the cops either side of me um, with our batons, batons out, just standing like this with our helmets, bright helmets on and we were, would have been about 400 metres from the park itself and in Palms North it was the first time that we actually confronted the demonstrators en masse. So if this is the road here and we were here Demonstrators are coming down here. I'm talking sort of uh, four or five thousand of them. Yeah, and there was about 20 cops blocking their way. Uh, pretty scary. Pretty scary. If they'd wanted to, they could have just walked right over us. But luckily, at that stage, at that stage anyway, the demonstrators were still just your ordinary mum and dad uh, students who still respected the law. And what happened was they would, we were standing there and they would get to about, about there and they would stop. So, and they wouldn't come any further. Then they'd wheel off and another group would come through and they would stop. So they're pretty much under control by the, by the guys who were organising it. Um, but it's still pretty scary when you're standing there and you know damn well that if they decided to, they'd walk right over top of you and the chances of getting injured, pretty high. So we had to be prepared for that as well as if they came any closer to start, start jabbing our batons at them and trying, trying to knock them backwards. Now the hardest thing is in a the, the demonstration in a big crowd is that these people at the front can see what's happening but the ones at the back can't see what's happening. So these people at the front are probably quite scared of, of getting, getting hit and clubbed and things, but they were being pushed, pushed from behind by the guys behind them. That's why they used to wheel away and come through. Yeah. The reason why we wore these things is, um, instead of just a normal uniform, 
at that game there. That's the Nelson game um, at Trafalgar Park, Nelson. Um, and as I said, the provinces were very supportive and there wasn't a lot of demonstrators. So we got time to watch the game. But prior to that day, we were um, sort of just on duty, sort of in various parts of Nelson, making sure that the demonstrators behaved themselves. Now, I always remember that at one stage we were in a car park outside the Big Flash Hotel where the Springboks were staying. There was a small group of demonstrators um, demonstrating at the hotel. And in, Nelson's a fishing, a fishing city, right? Very, fishing's a big thing. And they have the, fishermen have these things called tuna bombs, which is basically a large, a large um, firecracker. Um, and what they do is they light, light, the, light the tuna bomb when they're fishing, throw it in the water, it explodes, and dead fish come to the sea, come to the surface. Well, these guys, these demonstrators, started throwing these tuna bombs at us. Now, you imagine you're standing there, and there's a de demonstration where Mr Hudson is, and next minute, right by your feet, there's a blinking tuna bomb, and it goes off. You're going to be blinking. You could be hurt quite seriously, okay? Or um, you get a hell of a fright, one of those two. It wasn't just one tuna bomb, it was about four or five of them. So after that, after that game, and the other thing is we could have caught fire. Our uniforms, our police uniforms, were made of nylon. Nylon pants, nylon tunic, and a cotton shirt. Now, if, if we'd caught fire, we would have basically been dead. These things are made of wool, so they gave us some sort of protection against fire. But also, not just tuna bombs were being thrown at... Um, I can't remember what other place it was. Uh, a couple of Molotov cocktails were also thrown at the cops. You know what a Molotov cocktail is? Yeah. Yeah, just a glass bottle with um, petrol, rag, set fire to the rag, chuck it, it explodes, it catches fire, it explodes, and the petrol goes everywhere. So burning petrol. So these things here, they offer some protection against that sort of stuff. So that, that was Nelson. Um, this, this person here was the only, this, uh, Judy, she was the only policewoman on Red Squad. Um, this guy here, he eventually became an assistant commissioner. Um, these three guys here are three mics. Uh, you can see the wee red tag on, on our epaulet. That's what it was, just so they knew we were Red Squad, little red tag. Um, and then there's Mike, 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 uh, me and a guy, um, David Baker. And we're just watching the game there because um, the day of the game, um, the other cops did all the hard work. It wasn't that hard. It was, um, wasn't much going on in terms of demonstration. Um, this guy here, he's about six foot five and about sort of 17 stone. He's a big, big boy. Um, the rest of us are just probably bigger than me, but not much. Yeah. So that was Nelson, uh, fun, uh, tuna bombs, and somewhere else we had Molotov cocktails. So the chance of getting hurt at that stage, quite bad. Yeah. After Hamilton, uh, where did we go after Hamilton? Can't remember. I think we might have had a couple of days off. Can't remember. Anyway, the first, the first test at Wellington, once again, um, at, if this is Athletic Park, there's another park over here called McAllister Park. And at one stage we were in a line across the road here and McAllister Park was there and coming across the park was oh, probably about 4,000 demonstrators. Yeah, and they come, they come once again, they come right up to us. Um, I was probably about here, say, and there was a demonstrator standing right in front of me. Another one there, and they were pretty packed. And the person in front of me was someone you'd probably say was your mother. She was just a, a normal lady, about sort of 50 odd, uh, wearing glasses, but she was anti tour and she was demonstrating. And I knew that, I knew that if, if the push came to the shove, I would have to batten her 
if you moved a step closer. If I got the command from my, from my sergeant behind me, rapid action, I knew I'd have to go right, with my baton. This is a 50-year-old lady. <laughs> At that stage, I began to wonder, uh, yeah, what am I doing here? But, you know, I sworn an oath um, and I had a job to do and that was it. So you couldn't really start thinking too much. You had a job to do and that, that's what you had to do. If it come to, come to crunch, you'd have to batten somebody. Lucky you didn't, um, they eventually moved away and it wasn't a problem. Okay, so the Red Squad, our job basically was to look after Springboks. That was it. Where they went, we went. It's fantastic. We had, um, we had a week on the West Coast because um, they, they cancelled the Timaru game uh, because they couldn't guarantee the, the security of the field. So they cancelled the Timaru game and the Springboks and Red Squad, we had a week off over in the West Coast, over in Greymouth. Had a great time. Stayed at, the, stayed at a posh hotel, went skiing with the Springboks, all sorts of things. Um, and that was primarily to give the cops a bit of a break because at that stage the, the cops were pretty, getting pretty stretched. And like I was saying, you know, you're working 12-hour days and 14-hour days. So we had a week in, Grey, in Greymouth, then we came back to the Nelson game and carried on with the tour. Um, Christchurch test, once again, had the full support of the government, full support of the army, had all the bins set up around the outside, um, so the demonstrators couldn't get near to the to the park. We at Red Squad, we were tasked with policing inside the park, inside Lancaster Park in those days. As we're running out onto the field to, to form our cordon our, around the, around the um, field, about 20 or 30 demonstrators who had bought tickets got onto the pitch. And, and while they were running on and standing there, they were throwing broken glass, uh, tacks, nails onto the, onto the field to try and stop the game. Okay, so one of our sections, section two, got those people off the field and then other members of the Canberra Rugby Union, including ex All Blacks, they swept the field and got rid of all the, um, all the glass tacks and things um, so the game could carry on. And once again, it went without a hitch really, it was pretty quiet. Uh, the demonstrators were stopped away from the, from the park and the game went on. Things came to a head in Auckland. And as you said before, Auckland was the culmination of several weeks of frustration by the demonstrators, by the protesters. Okay? Really frustrated because they just couldn't, no matter what they did, they couldn't stop this game this tour from going ahead, and it was the final test. That's when things got ugly, really, really ugly. Anybody know about Auckland, the Auckland test match? What do you know about it? About some guy did like throw a plane with flower pots with nails on it and knocked out an all black. Yeah, good. And also like there was like pamphlets that got the cross thrown up over the field and stuff. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Yeah. Unfortunately, by that stage, the, the, dem the protest movement had been taken over by, shall we say, the least desirable members of society, um, the gangs. You had the Mughal mob, you had the Black Power, you had the headhunters, um, and all they wanted to do was have a go at the cops. They weren't really interested in um, what was going on the tour or what was happening back at South Africa. They just wanted to have a go at the cops. So at Eden Park, same, the same sort of scenario, the protesters were stopped away from the field so they couldn't get close to it. Um, you had the, had the guy in the, in the plane flying over, dropping flower bombs on the blinking field, and one hit uh, one of the All Black props, Gary Knight, um, put him on the ground, but he, being a prop, he got up and sort of shook his head and carried on. Um, what else did you have? 
You had flower bombs, you had the pamphlets, you had smoke bombs going, you know, um, being dropped on the field and smoke everywhere. It was like something you see out of um, some sort of futuristic blinking alien invasion, you know, where you have all the helicopters flying around and guns and stuff. But th that's what it looked like. We were outside again, and that was the second time that I thought that, ooh, I could get my beans here. We were tasked, we were actually deployed outside the field this time and we were on different, different roadblocks. Um, we had uh, rocks being thrown at us and I'm talking about you know, rocks, rocks about that size, you know, chucked at us. One of our guys got hit, um, as a result got a broken ankle out of that. Um, another one of our guys um, got severely dealt to by three or four protesters, um, broke both shoulder blades um, and was off work for a long, long time. Um, other guys had um, cuts on their hands and things from the rocks and bottles and stuff. Um, concrete blocks, you know, concrete blocks, fences made of blocks, they were being thrown, yeah. Our final, our final job was we had to run up a street called Onslow Street, which comes down to Eden Park, and at the top were a bunch of demonstrators, and what these guys were doing, there were cars parked on the side of the road, they were tipping, tipping this, these cars over and trying to set fire to them. So, you know, our job was to preserve the peace, to, to keep the law. So we had to run up Onslow Street, up a wee bit of a hill, um, and try and disperse these demonstrators so that they couldn't cause any more damage. And all while we were doing that, we had these rocks and stones thrown at us, concrete blocks. When we got there, a lot of these demonstrators had um, batons, you know, fence batons and stuff that ripped off people's fences. Um, so it was quite, a, quite an ugly scene. And that was the only other time during the tour I felt, ooh, this could be a bit dangerous. But hey, once again, you got, there was uh, say 10 of us in a line going up the street and 10 guys to back you up. That was it, against about, at that stage, 300 odd demonstrators. So, you know, it wasn't easy. Um, yeah, so broken leg for one guy, broken shoulder blades, heaps of cuts and bruises to the other cops. Um, yeah, that was um, pretty ugly, pretty ugly. The worst, one of the worst things of the whole tour was after the tour, after Springboks left the country, um, the complaints about police brutality started coming in from the, from the demonstrators. And our squad in particular was targeted. They reckoned they were just a bunch of thugs, thugs were going around beating the heck out of anybody and everybody. It wasn't like that, okay? Um, and unfortunately, the police hierarchy didn't back us up. They, they um, took every complaint at face value and we were, we were investigated quite heavily for our involvement in one particular incident involving two or three clowns at Eden Park who got, who got, uh, who got dealt to by somebody. It wasn't us. But we, you know, we were under, under the microscope for our, our tactics. You know, and they were looking for scapegoats to blame so that the demonstrators, the protesters, were basically sort of like, you know, your actions are vindicated, but the cops shouldn't have done this sort of style. Um, they never actually charged anybody with it, with, with any offences from the, from the police side of things. Um, but it wasn't, very, wasn't a very um, nice time to be on Red, on, on Red Squad. Um, and as a result of, of those complaints, um, Team policing, our, sec our whole, whole crew, we got disbanded and we got dispersed to other, other stations and other duties because um, they considered that we were too, too close to each other, too, too much palsy wellsy. Yeah. So, so that was quite, that was actually quite traumatic mentally to know that you know you're being fingered for something you didn't do, and you could lose your job, or you could appear before the courts on a charge of assault or something. Very, very stressful mentally. Yeah, so that was um, that was that was my uh, experience of of um, the Springbok tour. Um, the big question, I guess, is 
was I anti-tour or was I pro-tour? Now, before it started, before the tour began, we were given a choice. You can either go back to normal police duties or you can stay in the squad and help police the tour from a Red Squad point of view. So we were given a choice. And some of our guys did. Some of our guys, about three or four, said, nah, I'm, I'm not going to be involved in this tour because my principles don't allow me to. I don't like what's going on back in South Africa, um, apartheid and things. So they, they were... Um, they were allowed to leave the squad uh, with no, with no um, repercussions. And when the tour ended, they came back onto the squad before it was completely disbanded. I mean, you know, we, had, we had guys in our squad who were uh, Maori, who were Pacific Islanders. They were all there. So, you know, you can't say that we were all white Europeans. Um, we had a good mix of, of guys. Um, yeah. So that's it, really. Am I pro tour? Was I pro tour? Was I anti tour? Neither, really. As far as I was concerned, I had a job to do. Um, and I think most of the guys, I mean, let's speak from my perspective, and I think most of the guys were the same sort of thinking. We've got a job to do. We swore an oath when we become constables to uphold the law and to preserve peace. So this is our job. Now, in hindsight, would I do it again? I probably wouldn't go to the games, but watch it on, watch it on TV. Because <laughs> I'm a rugby man, and that was the culture, you know. Um, yeah, Springboks were the, the team to beat. So I probably wouldn't have gone to the games, but I, I would have watched it on TV. I would have been a, a silent protester, so to speak. Um, yeah, that's not to say I agree with apartheid. You know, it's a terrible, terrible blinking system. I don't know how, how one, one section of society can can um, bring in laws to sub subdue another section of society. Yeah. Question time. Any questions? Anything you're not sure of? Do I ask you a question about injuries? Yeah. Yep. Um, do, you got, do you know a guy named Tyrone Lawrenson? He was in the Red he, One of our sergeants. Um, he's my cousin. Cousin, yeah. yeah so he was one of the guys who was being fingered for this incident with um, the clowns. Top man, he's back in the island. Is he back here now? Um, I think he's still living in South Auckland. Is he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think he's still Ty Tyrone's a good example of how being on Red Squad could affect your career. Tyrone was a sergeant on, on Red Squad uh, and he was a really, really bright guy. Um, and he should have been made up to inspector about two years later after the tour. But because he was on Red Squad and involved in the tour, he got sort of pushed sideways for quite a long time. They wouldn't look at him as an inspector, a commission officer. But he finally got there. Um, yeah, top man, top man. And his brother, his brother Bo, another good man. Um, so why didn't, like, your bosses, like, help you? Like, why did they just leave you? You mean, do you mean our, our top brass so the, or yeah. the guys, like, yeah. the sergeants and stuff? Yeah, like, the top people just leave you. Oh, the dead people did it, yeah, and they just left it from the system. Why did they? Have you heard of heard of um, heard of politics? That's the main reason. All right, the government wanted a scapegoat for from Red Squad to make an example of somebody in the police, and our bosses weren't prepared to say no, because they would then their career would have gone would have levelled out. They wouldn't have got any higher. It's just all politics, yeah. Which is which is strange for the police because we're supposed to be independent of politics, but unfortunately. Um, politics invades everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yo. Was there any point during the tour when you regretted being a part of the Red Squad? Any point in the tour? That's a good point. Did it achieve anything? Probably not. No, no one. No one won. There were no winners, no losers. It didn't didn't achieve much back in South Africa. Um, from our point of view, um, from the police's point of view, it was just a big civil disorder. But it didn't achieve anything, the tour. Um, didn't change South Africa that much. So, no, there's no real no point. They could have cancelled it. Um, and the only thing that would happen was probably a new government the following year. Because the, those marginal seats I spoke about before, they would have probably voted Labour instead of National. Yeah. Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, I know you mean. Um, I guess it's where peer, peer pressure comes in. I've been on team policing for about two years at that stage, and these guys who are with me, they're all good mates. Um, and if, if I'd said no, mm, the peer pressure might have come in and sort of, well, Mac, what you're making wimp? What's wrong with, what's wrong with you? So, yeah. I mean, I was only 24, but still quite naive and young. Um, yeah. Does that sort of answer your question a little bit? Yeah. Anybody else? Well, who's playing games on their computers? <laughs> That's what I'd be doing. Hey, um, yeah, so, so that, was, that was Red Squad. Um, that was a, sort of a, my view of the police's stance. Not necessarily everybody's view, but it's my view. I'm only one person, okay? Um, I'm a primary source, obviously, but, um, yeah, hopefully, like I said, protesters, there's always three groups, and in the middle group is the cops who, who are the sam meat in the sandwich, who get blamed for everything. No matter what you do, you're not going to please everybody. Yeah. Okay. Is that long enough, Mr Hudson? Yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you, Mr Mackle. Uh, many thanks for coming in. That's all right. But, uh, there were some great questions there, actually, uh, yeah. from the class. So thank you. Let's uh, give them a round of applause. Well, don't worry. So if you read this book on page 125... Yeah, 125 is a picture of my section charging up the, up the street um, at the very end of the Eden Park game. Yeah. Well, and then also 127. One, There's Tyrone there. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, um, yeah. Good book to read. It's very biased. <laughs> okay.